Hello and welcome to today's EMBN show. We've got some very exciting new long travel, full power e mountain bikes from Merida. And Hans Ray is over from California. Now, Merida have just launched uh, a new platform of e-mountain bike, 170 mil travel in both a 750 watt hour and a 625 watt hour version. Uh, earlier in the week, I caught up with John Woodhouse from Merida. We're now joined by John Woodhouse from Merida to talk us through uh, the new range of e-mountain bikes. Uh, John, uh, Merida continue to evolve the fantastic E160, and I think, traditionally known for being a lively bike, a quiet bike, and obviously close connections with Shimano, right? So, so what have we got? Yeah, well, I mean, the new bikes are kind of an evolution of the old ones, so where we figured out we can improve it, we've taken the new suspension platform from our human-powered bike, uh, which provides a, a load of different benefits. I guess we'll dig into those in a bit. Basically, when we first launched the E160, your choices when it came to longer travel e-mountain bikes were basically like, it was a longer travel e-mountain bike, that, mm. that was that. But now we're kind of seeing the market kind of move into different places. So talk us through them. And uh, I, I did hear you say that these bikes are, these are the E160s, 170 mil travel? Yeah, yeah. So uh, inflation, <laughs> inflation works in your favour. That's great. I mean, why wouldn't you, right? Why wouldn't you have an e-bike, which is 170? Yeah. So the bikes now run 170 mil fork and there's actually 174 mil at the back. Okay, right. Um, and <clears> like <throat> with the previous E160, it's mixed wheel size. But with our new suspension platform from the human-powered bike, you can actually run a 29-inch wheel if you want to. Uh, and there's a geometry correcting chip so that the geometry doesn't get messed up if you yeah. do that. So, so let's be clear from the beginning. Now. You've, got, you've got three new bikes all sharing the same sort of platform. Um, you've got a 170 carbon, 170 aluminium. Just give us the three, the three main specs, so three, three main models here. The bike that we have here, this is the 160 CF. So this is the carbon fiber bike. So obviously more expensive, pricier, but obviously a lot lighter. Well, I see it's got a it's got an integrated battery in there, which is non-removable. Yeah. yeah. So this actually uses a 600 watt hour non-user removable battery. Obviously you can remove it for service, but uh, <clears throat> and that's actually boosted. You can see on this bike. We also do a 360 watt hour range oh, wow. extender, which is right. removable. So you can, <laughs> you know, it uses the range extender first. So you could ride, finish that off. Pop that back in your car, get back on the bike, continue. I mean, some, somebody who's like you, 65 kilos, you're going to be riding all day with that, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be honest, I, I imagine I'd easily get like a 1,000, maybe 1,100 metres climbing out of a 600 wire battery oh, on trail. Easy, easy, easily. Easy. And then with that thing, which kind of brings the weight up a little bit, also increases yeah. the range. The base weight of that bike, the carbon fibre bike with a 600 watt hour battery? So our top line model, yeah. um, the E160 10K, that comes in, I believe, at 21.8 uh, kilos, wow, so 20 okay. kilos. And that's, it's worth noting that that is with a proper rear tyre, so it's got a double down <laughs> rear tyre. It's got a proper fork on it, it's got a 38 fork. Uh, and basically the kit is built to last. It's not kind of like a fake spec bike. It's Do you know a, what, I, I was actually going to talk to you about that, the fact that we seem to be going down this lightweight route, but they are, a lot of these bikes are compromised with the component spec <sighs> and they're not really kind of built for purpose in many ways, are they? Yeah, I think I think that's the problem. That if you've just got weight as your as your only goal and get it as low as possible, well, of course that I don't doubt that you could probably build that down to like nineteen kilos and change, but it wouldn't be a very nice bike to ride, yeah, and exactly. it probably wouldn't survive more than a couple of rides. The other bike in the range which I noticed was the one with the EPA to one motor and and a removable seven hundred and fifty watt hour battery. Obviously, going to be a little bit more. I mean, that's the thing with e-bikes; that you know, weight is dictated by the battery capacity, right? Yeah, that, and there's there's no way around it. And the other thing is that a the seven fifty watt hour battery it's a big heavy item, but also because it's user removable, that also adds much more weight. Because the moment you go cutting a big hole in your down tube, you have to add in a lot of material to reinforce that. So on the carbon bike. We don't have to do that. So I think we shaved something like 300 grams out versus the old carbon frame, which is a fair amount. Uh, whereas with that bike, you just can't do that. If you want to use a removable battery, you have to reinforce it. A lot of the other brands are, are making uh, light to mid assist bikes, which are, you know, they're probably around about 18 to 20 kilos. So uh, will Marie be making one of those bikes in the foreseeable future? I wouldn't, I wouldn't count it out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the that thing, like, uh, when it comes to kind of light and mid support, there's a lot of really cool options on the market at the moment. So obviously that is something that we're looking at. But, but this I is mean, 22 kilos. I mean, this is the thing, though, that if you've got a bike that's 
full support, has a decent sized battery as standard that can also be extended into a really big battery, you know, over 900, what was it, 960 watt hours. Yeah. And then weighs like, I mean, 22 odd kilos. I mean, do you, do you really need it? it? I guess it depends on the build of the rider that's using it, what you want to do. I've been meaning to ask you that actually, is your 65 to 70 kilos, I get a lot of people that, you know, I'm sure you guys are keen to hear what John's going to say about this, is that they feel that a, a six to 700 watt hour bike, which is around about 20 kilos, is too much to handle. What's, what's your, what, yeah. what would you say to that? Well, I think the first thing is that riding this bike, which is, you know, a good few kilos lighter and also the weight being lower down, that turns into a corner very, very differently. It just feels like a conventional bike. Whereas on the kind of the full fat, big battery bike, you notice the extra weight. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there's- I mean, you personally, I'm talking now. Yeah, yeah. So, but the thing is in the unpowered bike, I ride a size long, which is like 500 mil mil reach. In that- Whoa, hold on. Yeah, yeah. And how tall are you? Uh, what's it, 172 centimetres. And you ride a, you ride a 500 mil yeah. reach bike? Yeah, wow, yeah. that's really interesting. Yeah. Do you De think, definite size queen. <laughs> I, I mean, this is a whole, we're going down a whole new rabbit hole here. Do you think, do you think e-man bikes need to have the same reach as, as a mountain bike? Uh, no, and that's essentially what we've done with the geometry of this is that the head angle is actually a little bit steeper, the seat angle is actually a little bit slacker. And our, our normal, our human powered bike is pretty progressive. It's like 79 degree seat angle, 64 head angle big long reaches across the range. Whereas this, I think is about 11 mil shorter size for size, but also because of our sizing system, which is a reach-based sizing system, there's also another way to skin the cat. Sorry, Knuckles. <laughs> um, which is that if you want to add a bit more kind of pop and liveness back into the ride, you just go for a smaller size. So I've been riding around on the 750 uh, watt hour bike. I've actually been riding a short and on most trails, it's really good fun because like, you yeah. can pop it, you can turn it in. It's quite agile and lively. Is this where the agilometer comes in? Yes, this is our... Who, who made up agilometer? <laughs> uh, I, I don't want to take all the credit for that, Steve. <laughs> but yeah, this is our idea that if you design a bike with a short seat tube, um, and also we have our own travel adjustable post, so the dropper post can be travel adjusted from 230 to 30 mil, uh, tool free, and that basically means that you basically, you pick the bike size that you want based on the handling that you want. So if you're going longer, if you want something more stable, that's just kind of like plow on nicely. Whereas if you like a bike that's a bit more kind of like lively, easier to turn in, kind of all around shorter, you can do that, but the bike will still fit you properly. Uh, and the other part of that is we actually have relatively short head tubes. I like that because, actually, yeah. Yeah, the old, the old uh, E160 had quite a tall head tube, which is nice, it's very like welcoming kind of riding position. But with this, you can still get to the same height if you want to. But obviously, if you've got a tall head tube, you can't go any lower than the head tube. Yeah, yeah. So it just gives you a few more options. And it means that people can basically, we're not saying that like a long bike is best or a short bike is best. It's like that's entirely up to the person that buys it. Yeah. Um, John, thanks so much. I mean, I think options is is uh, the key these days with e-mounted bikes. I think these two readers here and the other one in the range, I'm really excited to ride them. You know, 22 kilos, 24 kilos, 600 watt hour battery, 750 watt hour battery. Shimano, we haven't even talked about Shimano EP801. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which is, you know, it's a different motor to, to the older E8000 and EP8. So, uh, folks, if you have any questions about these new bikes, um, they are available for sale right now, right? Yeah, yeah. John, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we'll leave the pricing down in the link down below. Uh, yeah, I think uh, time now to give Knuckles some food. Zoom love your new bikes there, Steve. We've got more new bikes to talk about in a bit, but let's catch up with Hans Ray, shall we? Absolutely. Hans, great to have you. Just flown in, have you? Yeah, it's good to be back here. Yeah, back in England for five weeks. I just got in a few days ago and yeah, yeah I'll be... Who, who'd you fly with? Uh, United, I always fly United. I, yeah. I'm the million mile uh, <laughs> member, so I have like this preferred status, which I'm very glad about. You get like yeah. little little upgrades and perks and launches and stuff. That makes all the difference, extra leg room. So you, uh, you're you stuck in your ways when it comes to f aircraft then, are you? Yeah, yeah, uh, you, you you learn over the years, you know, like, and especially as you get older. This time, I think I had the worst jet lag ever. <laughs> I don't know if it's age or what it is, but um, it's, um, but yeah, I prefer the direct flights and all that, you yeah, know, yeah. stopovers and yeah. all that. Yeah, too right. I guess this is part now of an annual sort of back and forth from the UK 
And uh, and California, right now for you? It's been has it been like that for quite a few years coming? Yeah, because my my wife's from England, mm. and we have a place in the East Midlands, so we spend some time here. And in the old days, my base used to be my parents' place in Switzerland, or I used to have a camper van in Europe, which which the boss is not really there anymore. So so now. My European base is, you know, when I come in the summer, instead of flying back and forth across the Atlantic three times, yeah. we'll, we'll come for the summer and then I'll do my travels from here. And, and we like a bit of, I mean, Laguna Beach is a beautiful town in the city and I'm really grateful to be able to live there most of my life. But we miss the old world too. And, <laughs> and so we like to come back, but. Yeah. Well, wow, really exciting times. You've got a new tour underway. Guys, have a look at Speakers from the Edge to get your tickets. There's 16 tours throughout the UK over the next, uh, well, I guess the next month or so. All in March. It starts March 5th and it's a live stage talk tour. Yeah. So, uh, mishaps and mayhem. Yeah. So I'm quite surprised about that. I thought you lived a quite a sheltered life, Hans, being a Charles Ryder. <laughs> Don't, don't get, you know, there's no, you know, I have been really lucky throughout my career to have no, like, life-changing, catastrophic events, so it's not about that. Mm. But there's stuff that happens on all my travels and trips and filming that we usually don't talk about. <laughs> and we kind, of, we kind of let the cat out of the bag here on a few stories, stuff that we haven't told before or shown. And, but it's really, basically, it's featuring different stories from throughout my career. There's some very recent stuff and there's some some old stuff and everything in between and yeah it's 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 supposed to be entertaining and fun and and i mean there must be so much uh there must be so much gold over all those i mean I, I, like you you were talking to me earlier you know when you, you first went to laguna in 1987 i mean that's that's a lot of experience in that time of and I, you know I've, I've met you in lots of places throughout the world there must be some real nuggets in there right yeah you know but the thing is for the for those first 20 years when i was in america there was no cell phones really <laughs> so we don't have everything like there's a lot of really great memories and stories in my head which sometimes are hard to document because you could have done the coolest things and you didn't have a cell you know mm. if not you know if there wasn't a professional photographer which I was lucky about I always like a lot of my stuff got documented and filmed mm. but like everyday thing you run into like a famous person or you you, you know something cool happened yeah. it's like not like uh, you had the cell phone handy but it was really good to be in Southern California in those early late 80s early 90s the whole action sport world was so I got a bit I got to tangle or tango with a bit the skateboard scene the extreme skiing scene the BMX scene the the all of that stuff, you know, even the music industry, I had friends in there and you got to see some of these like bands play and the Hollywood thing and, and it, was, it was exciting and it was like, yeah, it was just like, there was no expectations. It was just like oh. going out and mountain biking just went to the roof you, after that. You say there was no, there's no footage from the first 20 years, but I mean, let's face it, you got the Laguna Rads, like, you know, pioneering mountain bike club in Laguna Beach back in the 80s? Yeah, the OG Freeriders, really. I mean, that's the oldest standing mountain bike club in the world. They, they celebrated 40 years last year. Wow. And they, they were known and, I mean, still are, but they, they're still around. But they would ride trails cheaper than anybody else. And they cared less about racing and Lycra. And they would be like hike and bike, bushwhacking, drinking yeah. beer and riding stuff yeah. that nobody else would at the time. And you became part of that back in the 80s, didn't you? Yeah, I was luckily introduced to them right away when I came to America. And they embraced me and they introduced me to mountain biking and they made me a real mountain biker. And I think... Part of the reason I'm still around is because I, I, I ride with them once a week when I'm in town. Oh, wow. And the rides are pretty hard, so they keep you on your toes. You guys, Laguna Rads, have been still riding. What's the, what's the current situation in California with regards like trail access for e-mountain biking? Oh, it's getting, it's getting better all the time. And there's a lot of really cool organizations like People for Bikes. They yeah, do yeah. so much for, for e-bikers and bike riders in general. I mean, amazing organization. They lobbying in Washington for rights and funding and, and access and all that stuff. And um, yeah, there, there's more and more places where the bikes are accepted, even by the riders, but also by the authorities. There's still some parks who, where it's not allowed, but it's up to the parks. And often they, 
they don't really enforce it. They, they just mm -hmm. turn a blind eye, you know, as long as you kind of behave. But, um, um, but we're still working on stuff. The problem over there, I think, is those search and bikes, you know, those racer X, those, what the kids have, those little bikes. Yeah. They gotten really popular and the kids ride wheelies down the roads and they often don't even know the traffic laws or the, mm -hmm. you know, and stuff. And they now starting like converting those bikes with like, downhill forks and better tires and they start hitting the trails and that's it's conflict it's, because, the, it's the same in the uk there's you know there's like uh, uh they call it like terrorist groups on on, <laughs> on motorized bikes but i mean you know i ride motorcycle but it's about you know you got to ride in the right places where you know there's proper access haven't you but it's damaging you know the reputation for e-mountain biking sometimes isn't it the pedal assist e-bikes the class one that we know and that we ride with the speed limit and all that they got off on the wrong foot in America. In Europe, in Europe, it was always looked at a bicycle. In America, they were used to, when it came to electric, these high-powered, thousand-watt, now throttle things and so whenever you say e-bike, they all, they still, it's getting better, but they still, where's the throttle? And, That's and, interesting. And then there's this, this, this fine line between, is it a bicycle or a motorcycle? The pedal is class one, is a bicycle. We, mm. we dress like a biker, we have a bike helmet on, we have bike components on, we have bike friends and we want to ride bike trails. So it's not like yeah. that we go in the desert and... And I guess there's different laws in different states as well, isn't there, in America, yeah. which yeah. makes it even more complicated. Uh, so talk about your, uh, what's, what's your schedule in terms of uh, riding bikes these days then? Are you on the, on the E-Mountain bike? Are you on the Trials bike? What's, what's, how do you spend most of your time? I do both. I mean, I, I do analog and e-bike. I do more e-bike these days. Um, I just have more fun on it. You know, the <laughs> e-bikes were invented at the right time in my career or my life. It's great, isn't it? And I've been a great e-bike advocate. You know, my first e-bike ride was in 97. I don't think many people can say that. Wow. Yeah. Crikey, what? Um... And with no other than President George Bush Sr. Damn, of course. I did a, I did right, a lap yeah. with him. <laughs> But that, that was early on. But then I did convert an e-bike, and this is well, also so early. Well, you could be the, yeah. You were the first mountain biker to ride an e-bike, then, possibly. Well, With the I president was, of America. I, I want to <laughs> just say this. I was open to it. Like, in 2008, I converted one of my GT Force mountain bikes yeah. with a rear hub motor, with a, one of those Bionics, mm -hmm. put the battery on, and I rode that around. And even, and this was more like my post office bike. But I remember, I remember riding it on a few off-road rides and I keep telling people, you know what, I think now I know what EPO uh, <laughs> does. You know, I felt, I, I, on that bike, I felt like about 15, 20% stronger. And then fast forward when the mount, when the e-bike boom really kicked in and, and Euro bike and stuff, I remember like telling people, man, these e-bikes are cool. Yeah. And at the time GT didn't have one, but I remember some pro riders, and some of them turned later into these really famous, they had a career because of e-bikes, but yeah. they were laughing at me going, <laughs> oh, e-bikes, you're getting old and fat and gray. And, yeah. and, and so, and then eventually GT came out with, their, with an e-bike in 2016, and I could really embrace it. And now I'm, I'm one of Shimano's uh, e-bike ambassadors. I've been working closely with them over the last few years, and of yeah. course still with GT after all these years. And, um, it's been it's been good and it's great to see. It just opens up all these possibilities. I mean, it, you don't really have to sell the e-bike anymore these days. It's just like it's just it's just fun, you know. Yeah. yeah. So. So what's what's planned for the rest of the year then, Hans? Well, it's you know busy months of the tour, obviously. Yeah, I'm, I want to do another one of my urban adventures. I've been doing these urban yeah. adventure trips where I traverse yeah. these really big cities, but cities that have also incredible yeah. uh, mountain biking around. Folks, if you're not seeing them, Hans did a fantastic one in Los Angeles and also in Hong Naples Kong, as well, right? In Mexico. Yeah. And San you Francisco. You did that with Warner, didn't you? The one yeah, in Mexico. Yeah. yeah. And I'm planning, I'm trying to get PD out to come with me to Vancouver this summer. Nice. So I'm planning that. And I'm working with the Swiss region called uh, Decentis at Rune. It's near the Gotthard. And we, we, we establishing a new, really cool e bike tour. And you would love this. It's, it's the Gotthard Mountain right in the middle. Yeah. And we have a, co a tour, the working title is Labyrinth Tour. And it's like a multi day e bike tour circumnavigating. And that's right in the Decentis at Rune region. That, then, so, uh, that sounds like my cup of tea, that. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm working on a few projects in Laguna Beach. They're really embracing now mountain biking, and it's such a beautiful destination. I mean, so many mountain bikers come there already because it's such a cool holiday spot, and the riding is world-class, and so, so all of that, you know. 
Yeah, plenty on then. Well, yeah. Hans, thanks so much for uh, for coming to visit us. Um, best luck with the tour. I'm sure it'll be uh, full of mishap and mayhem. I'm really interested <laughs> well, to see what, to, some, what some of these I, stories I are. not too much, but come, <laughs> come and see one. I, right. you know, let me know. Yeah, so guys, you're going to get your tickets yeah. from yeah. Uh, Speakers from the Edge. Thanks, Hans. Thank you. Well, he's quite a character, isn't he? Got some experience <laughs> and he's been needed on that. I'd like to know what's going to not make the cut in the mishaps and mayhem <laughs> tour. I mean, there's going to be things which are not going to be said. Well, we've right? had some controversial chats within the studio that he couldn't remember. Blake remembered carrying him home in Lavinia. His watch room, he lost somewhere that night and he didn't remember any of that. So Wow. He's probably forgotten more good stories than he can remember. Yeah, but what a what an absolute legend. Um, time now for some uh, photographs from where you guys have been over the last few weeks. Starting off with um, Robert is Lev Levo Gen 3 in... Croatia, this is. Croatia. Nice bit of limestone there. Limestone, deadly in the <laughs> wet, but all right if it's sunny and dry. Um, a lovely slab ride here in Squamish from Rick. Oh, I'm dying to go to Squamish on the bike. Really? Yeah, I think it'd be amazing. I'm I mean, it's, it's, it's the dream, isn't it, really? Have, have I ridden that trail? Maybe. I've only ridden there once. Don't really? Know, it looks a bit like that. It's an amazing place. Don, I think you, I think you need to uh, get over to Squamish or I do an eat bike. Yeah, for I'm sure. I've been trying to angle this for about three years. Okay, well, we'll need to angle harder then. <laughs> uh, and then finally, we've got Anthony's, another specialised in Kerry Island. That's that. It looks amazing, isn't it? Uh, actually, that's not the last one, folks. We've got another one here from uh, Ferilla around the Medias Transylvania in Romania. I've heard it's wild around there for <laughs> riding. They do those enduro motorbike uh, races around there. Apparently, yeah. there's just miles and miles of hills and woods. What bike could you take? Uh, probably, KTM. I was going to say, a 350F, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yep, folks, that's so much for sending your photographs in. It's uh, definitely inspirational, places I'd certainly like to get to. Feedback, Steve, you are some brutal, <laughs> well, not brutal, but Patrick, no, Pete Fitzpatrick. Don, the brutal are the better. He disagrees with you, the oracle of e bikes Steve. He says, you say that the most of the evolution has happened. I disagree. I think the combined motor automatic gearbox will be a game changer for most riders when it hits the mass market. Well, that's the problem. It's not there yet. This, yeah. this couple with, with belt drive, uh, it could produce low maintenance, high mobility products. Yes, I think that's what we all want. But it's still a could, isn't it? it? Yeah, I think that's what everyone is asking for. I do, you know what? I shot a video about uh, e-bike tech coming to regular mountain bikes. The future oh, you, didn't, of, you kept that one to yourself? Well, <laughs> obviously we're seeing auto shift and free shift and co-shift. Yeah, because so yeah. that going to trickle down. Is now the order of tech. It comes first to e-bikes and then it trickles down to mountain bikes. Not all of it, obviously. But Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I think, I think from an e-mountain bike perspective, even before we've got to, you know, combine motor, motor, motor gearboxes, maybe smaller batteries as well. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, this, this was all about, I, I think the big steps have taken in terms of the, the layout of an e-mountain bike, the Levo back in 2015. Things haven't changed massively since then. Yeah, I'm going off topic here, but there's a question for you, Steve, or something we need to do. I wonder if some uh, brand motors and batteries burn at a different rate. I've found that a Bosch battery, be it the same watt hour as mm -hmm. a Shimano or whatever, that seems to last longer than the others. Are you just angling to go out on your e-mountain bike for a long amount well, of time? Well, I was trying to work out how I'd do it, <laughs> and I'd have to do three bikes, three batteries, all in yeah. one mode, and then three bikes. Exactly. You're and probably looking at two weeks' worth of work. You have to ride in bikes. It's difficult, but I'd like to know, because it seems to me, like, you know, you go and ride with friends with different bikes and batteries, they burn at a different rate. Obviously, there's loads of variables. They, they do. There's no doubt about it, yeah. Uh, that's a... Bloody good video that is done. Uh, and actually, one more comment here from uh, Michael Michael Lossier, who said, and this is in relation to my mountain bike versus e mountain bike video, which I did at uh, Madonna de la Guardia in Finale, fantastic trail, where I rode the Pivot Firebird <coughs> versus the Canyon Strive. I really like your content, but to be honest, what's the big thing of being someone seconds faster or slower? As you already stated, someone younger, fitter, taller, or smaller. In other words, another person might or might not change the whole story. At least I don't care. I, I totally agree with you. It wasn't, it wasn't about the times. It was actually about the experience and, and the handling of the bikes downhill. Mm, I t totally agree. I mean, I, I'm guilty of timing videos and them being two seconds difference. Well, you are a professional downhill racer. It was. But then, then I go, oh, look, there's a conclusion. Actually, two seconds is nothing. What my only 
occasional issue with e-bikes is where I'm above the limit and I really want to pedal mm. and it's not worth it. That on an all mountain bike, and it's nothing, it's very marginal, and for some tracks it will never matter. But sometimes I'm like, ooh, it's a bit frustrating. Yeah, do you know what? It's an argument that will just go on and on and on. We but could argue forever, Steve. We could, and we probably will do by the end of the day. <laughs> John, we're in the bike vault. Can you lead this one? I don't know how things are in the GM. Really? Dirt well, we take a look at our lovely viewers bikes. This is Michael's Pole, Pole Voima in West Sussex. There's a few of these around for quite a jazzy, exotic bike. I've seen a few on the trail. I've seen a gold one. Mm. Been dovey. Yeah. Uh, CNC machined in two, glued together in the middle. Fancy bikes coming from Finland. Oh, I see. Oh, you spend quite a bit of time in the bike vault, then analysing the bikes. Well, see, I'd be gone. I'd be down at well, bike number take four. a look at them. <laughs> it's very nice. It's SRAM Eagle GX, I believe. Drivetrain. I like it. It's 81 degree C2 bangle. Is that correct? Or do you use it if you calibrated your eyes recently? Mm, nope. It's 81 degrees. Uh, moving on now to... <laughs> it is a nice shot. <laughs> nice shot. Sam White E160, South Burrell, Isle of Man. Oh, I yeah. love the shallow depth want of field. to go. My idea is to go to the Isle of Man on TT week with an <laughs> e-bike and ride between bits <laughs> to have a look around. Yeah, know? yeah, like your style. Uh, nice. Ooh, this is different. Bit of snow. So Cannondale Matera Neo 3. Mm. Uh, Don, I, I really like the new Cannondale bikes, the new Matera SLs, because they've got that good old-fashioned Cannondale logo yes. on the down tube. You see, they, they went a bit kind of minimalist with, I saw with you, the older bikes. You've been catching up with young Josh Bryson riding around on his, have you? He's not that young, is he? He's not, not anymore. Uh, it's nice. And uh, then finally, this is Robus Levo Gen 3. We've customized. seen it. There it is. We saw it earlier. This is in uh, Croatia, the gravel pit. I think it. that it. is a super nice shot. a whopping front disc on it. Is that 220? 220. 220 Magura, isn't it? Mm. Very nice. Yeah. Or maybe it's not. Yeah, maybe it is. Folks, lovely bikes, particularly Robert. Uh, some social clips now. Jamiroquai. JK, no less. JK, Space Cowboy. Is it Space Cowboy? Hey, he's out on his Scott in Snowdonia. I actually know where this is. It's on a, on a beach near Haraleka Castle. Lovely. But it's nice to see him, see him enjoying himself. Not got off the Ferrari and on the e-bike. Has he got a Ferrari? Well, he? He's mad keen in his car, isn't Didn't he? he live in Danley on Thames? I have no idea. Obviously, he's moved to Wales, which I like. <laughs> uh, and then next up, Squirrel Squeezer and her husband, boyfriend, have been out in Moab. Um, this it, is an insane It rock. is, but is this not the one that... Um, this is legit. You yeah, isn't this the one here. that Remy Metale got told off for? No, he was told off, but this isn't that rock. This is the one they go up in jeeps. I've apparently, you it. can ride this rock, but look how steep it, it is. It's lion's back, I've seen that. There you Whoa. Go. That is, look, I'm sure it's really grippy. It's, Would you fancy but, that? Yeah, but you wouldn't want to come off on it. No. Um, and then finally, uh, this is a clip which actually we did with Chris Ackrig when he was out in, um, out, sorry, up in North Wales a few months ago. Yes. Uh, I hope you did tune into the video we did with Josh Bryson, which came out last weekend. Uh, pretty mind blowing for Josh Bryson's, that's for sure. Uh, and that's it for this week's EMBN show. Uh, next week, we will actually be out in Taiwan to bring you some of the latest and greatest from that part of the world. That's going to be exciting. I'm sure there'll be some new stuff there to check out. Mm. So see you then.